Exploration and cartography are intertwined. Exploration is how geographic knowledge is often gained, and exploring new lands is dependent on the understanding of the geography that is already known. Even today with our modern tools, this is still true. In this video, we'll take a glimpse at this relationship by looking at a part of the world that was once filled in by a piece of a mysterious landmass that kept the world from tipping over, and through part of its transition to a real landmass that we know to exist today. Specifically, this video will cover the contact, exploration, and mapping of Australia by the Dutch in the 17th century, which was named by them New Holland. As I so often do when beginning my research, let's go to raremaps.com and once again search for Australia. We'll sort the maps by issue date. There's the Java La Grande map we covered in part two of this series, and many Terra Australis maps. But on the early to mid 17th century maps, we see this. Europeans had officially made contact with Australia. This was done by Dutch explorer Willem Janszoon. He was sent by the Dutch East India Company, also known as the VOC, to explore New Guinea and other unknown lands to the east and south of it. The voyage's purpose was to search for potential trade opportunities, but also to find the fabled gold in the region, a rumor that went back centuries to the stories of Marco Polo. The original chart and ship's journal have been lost. However, a manuscript copy of the original chart showing the details of the voyage was made around the year 1670. But Yanzun and his crew sailed just short of the Torres Strait, which separates New Guinea and Australia. So he actually mistook the Australian coast as a continuation of New Guinea. It's a little blurry on this map, but you can see what is actually Cape York Peninsula Yanzun called New Guinea. The coasts of Australia were not seen again by the Dutch until an important change in Dutch navigation occurred in 1617. The VOC adopted new sailing directions, cutting the sailing time to the region in half. The new procedure involved sailing around the Cape of Good Hope into the region of the westerly winds between the 36th and the 44th parallel, then heading east for almost 4,000 nautical miles before turning north. But methods of measuring distance at the time didn't take into account the strength of currents, and as a result, ships regularly overshot their turning point, and instead were ending up on Western Australia's coastline by accident. One of these ships was commanded by a man named Dirk Hartog. His ship landed in 1616, and was the first recorded European landing on the western coast of Australia. The discovery is shown here, on this 1630 world map, published in an atlas engraved by a man named Peter van den Kier and was made for Johannes Klopenberg, another Dutch cartographer. It was the first atlas that possessed a map that showed any part of the Australian coastline. But this world map is a reduced version of a 1625 world map by Jodocus Hondius II, who died in 1629. This 1625 map was the first world map to show the Dutch encounters with the west coast of Australia. But it's not included on another 1630 world map by Henricus Hondius, the year after his brother Jodocus Hondius II died. These inconsistencies are common in 17th century cartography, and it's often tough to explain why. Sometimes discoveries show up, disappear on published maps soon after, before finally permanently sticking. But the maps being made for different purposes and projects being started years in advance are possible reasons. What's interesting though is that this 1630 map includes information of a 1623 voyage to Australia, which is obviously later than the 1616 information included here, which makes the absence of the information and instead putting Terra Australis back as covering the area even more confusing. In 1623, another VOC explorer, Jan Karstens, sailed much of the same route as Jan Zoon had in 1606. We know these are his contributions on the map because all the place names were established by him. This exploration was deliberate. Karstens' purpose of the voyage was like Jan Zoon's, to look for ways to make a profit, so he charted rivers on the Cape York Peninsula's coast, since possible inland routes would be important in the search for natural resources and trade. There are also other voyages not included in this 1630 map that occurred before 1623, but they were all accidental in nature. This is a 1627 map by Dutch cartographer Hessel Gerritz. These contacts with Australia would have likely shown up on his maps before other prominent cartographers because he was the official VOC cartographer at the time. Keep in mind north is pointed to the left on this map. These contacts include one in 1618, which was commanded by Willem Janszoon himself, one in 1619, 
and another in 1622. On an updated Garrett's map, we see a couple more contacts. One on the southern Australia coast in 1627, and another in the northwest in 1628. To make the Hondius maps even more confusing, the family published a 1636 map of South and Southeast Asia that included the northern contacts, yet their world maps continued to be published using the old geographic information. The family firm, which would have been made up of Henricus Hondius and his brother-in-law, Jan Janssen at this point, must have decided to simply continue using the same plates anyway. But this map was actually copied from a map by a rival cartographer, Willem Blau. It's likely that Blau would have been one of the first cartographers to know about the newly charted borders. Hessel Garretts had been an apprentice of Willem Blau's, and they remained close friends. His map may have been the first time the Hondius family had seen the contact of 1628. With all of the accidental voyages to Australia, it's likely that rumors were circulating that the landmass was actually an island. The Dutch planned a voyage to find out. This time, the instructions were to sail to the east, and then south, then west, so that the ship would circumnavigate the continent, proving if it were an island. The voyage was undertaken in 1636, but weather prevented the circumnavigation from happening, and the voyage was deemed a failure. However, they did make contact with an area that had not been previously visited by Europeans, the northern coastline of the Cobourg Peninsula and Melville Island. In 1642, the then Governor General of the East Indies decided to organize yet another voyage for the purpose of discovery. As usual, the hope was to find sources of wealth and commerce, but also to settle once and for all the dimensions of the continent, which was by then clearly not just an extension of New Guinea. This included finding a northern route between New Guinea and Australia, which maps at the time appear to indicate was likely. In fact, just months after Willem Janzoon had run into the continent back in 1606, a Spanish sailor, Luis Vaz de Torres, whom the strait is named after, had sailed through it, though he never actually laid eyes on Australia to his south, and his discovery would not be widely known until 1770, after a Scottish geographer came across his accounts and published them. The person chosen to lead this expedition was Abel Janzoon Tasman. In August of 1642, Tasman, his two ships, and crew set sail from Batavia, which is modern-day Jakarta, Indonesia. The ship's first stop was Mauritius, where they refitted the ships and set off again in October towards Australia. In late November, Tasman and his crew landed on the island that is now named after him, Tasmania, the first Europeans to do so. But the island was never thoroughly explored due to poor weather, and the explorers moved on without determining if Tasmania was an island or connected to the mainland. On the 13th of December, Tasman saw land again, having reached the shore of South Island, New Zealand, again the first Europeans to do so. Three Dutchmen were killed by natives, and Tasman decided it wouldn't be possible to befriend them, so they moved on to the North Island. Tasman could not find suitable fresh water in New Zealand, so the explorers turned northeast, discovering Tonga in early 1643. The explorers then turned northwest and discovered the Fiji Islands. Tasman then suggested returning to Batavia. The ship's committee agreed. They made it back in June, having become the first Europeans to circumnavigate the whole of the Australasia region. While Tasman made significant geographic discoveries, commercially, this voyage was a failure. He was sent on another voyage in February of 1644. This time, he was directed to find a passage between New Guinea and Australia but he narrowly missed the strait. He did, however, chart Australia's northern coastline. This 1726 map shows what was known of the region after Tasman's voyages. Take a look at another notable map. It's from 1663 by French cartographer Melchizedek Thevenot. It incorporates Tasman's observations as well, but what makes this map even more significant is that it is the first devoted entirely to both Australia and New Zealand. The main source of information for this map was maps by Johannes Blau, the son of Willem Blau. Johannes was at the time the VOC's official cartographer, but he was also publishing publicly available maps with the information he had access to through his work with the VOC. But as you may have noticed on this map, the idea of the mythical landmass Terra Australis was still hanging on. This is the shape that Australia would keep on maps for more than a century. Another noteworthy voyage wouldn't be made to New Holland again until 1696-97, when a voyage was sent to find any survivors of a shipwreck. During the voyage, a cartographer aboard the ship created more detailed maps of Australia's west coast. 
In 1705, a Dutch voyage was sent to make a survey of the north coast, but little was charted, and a 1756 expedition was made for the same purpose, but it achieved nothing. After 150 years of exploration, the Dutch lost interest in the continent. From what they could tell, it lacked both water and fertile soil. It was seen as unsuitable for permanent colonization. Though they had named it New Holland, they never actually claimed Australia as Dutch territory. But just as they lost complete interest and sailed away, two other European powers began to take interest in the continent. But I'll cover that in part four of this series. Before I end the video, thank you to raremaps.com for supporting my video and giving me high definition images of many of the maps you saw in this video. Raremaps.com is an online antique map shop, but as you saw in the video, they are a big part of the research that goes into these videos. On their website, you can purchase your own antique Australia map, including many of the New Holland maps I showed you in the video. Again, that's raremaps.com. And big thanks to my Patreon subscribers as well. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you for watching.